a, well, good morning and thank you. Uh, I'd like to actually start with a question. Uh, how many of you are currently treating FH patients in your practice? Show of hands. So I would say that's very few. 10, 15, 20 percent, something like that? Okay. How many of you have more than 200 patients in your practice? More than 200? With FH? No, 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 no. No. How many of you have more than 200 patients in total in your practice? More than 200 patients in total in your practice? No. Just raise your hand. More than 200 patients in total in your practice. Pretty much everybody, would you say? Okay. All right, let's go. So here we go. So our, so our understanding of uh, FH is now exploding, and these are my disclosures. Just look at the bottom, please. Forget all the other uh, disclosures. Uh, the passion and bias to raise awareness about FH, uh, I think that that is a bias. You know, I obviously want to raise awareness, and that will impact my uh, discussion here today. Um, these are uh, uh, the objectives of today uh, to really discuss how things have changed quite dramatically over just a few years, actually. Um, discuss the genetic aspects of the disorder, the pathophysiology, the clinical presentation, diagnosis and screening, and our current management options. I'm actually going to limit our current management options because that will be discussed in many other uh, uh, lectures. This is particularly relevant now in the, uh, in the new era of PCSK9 inhibitors because one of the indications is FH. So we have to be able to identify in our practices who has or does not have FH in order to know who's a candidate for this new class of drug. So it is a genetic disorder. And in 1972, Goldstein and Brown described the, this disorder and initially thought it was secondary to HMG coenzyme A reductase, and then a year later corrected themselves and said it was an LDL receptor issue. Um, the, their then original presumption was that this was secondary to an LDL receptor mutation uh, that caused a defective function. Um, they thought there was a single mutation that uh, in, in this gene, the LDL receptor gene, and uh, based upon an analysis of people with premature cardiovascular disease, premature infarcts, um, they estimated the prevalence of the heterozygotes to be one in 500 and homozygotes one in a million. And unfortunately, as a consequence of that, all of us going through medical school and other forms of training uh, learned that we would never see these people in our practices. And I would imagine that most of us recall learning that as we went through our training. We'll never see these people. Uh, and that has stuck with us. I want to point out also that the relationship between heterozygous and homozygous FH is fixed, meaning uh, the, the uh, heterozygous and, and homozygous FH are connected by the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. It's an equation. So some papers will somehow disconnect these two numbers. You can't do that. If you have one number, it has to be very, it has to be connected to that other number. And, and just pay attention to that uh, as you read the papers. So today, we now understand that the number is really closer to 1 in 200. That's why I asked who in the audience is taking care of 200 or more patients, and everybody said yes, and yet about 20 percent or 10 percent said that they're taking care of FH patients currently. Well, in fact, uh, the reality is everybody in this audience has FH patients in his or her practice. So this is something to understand. So when we all go back to practice uh, on Monday, we have to start looking for our FH patients. Um, you're not alone, though, because it's estimated that fewer than 10 percent, and some people say that even fewer than 1 percent of FH patients have been identified in the United States. And that's across the world, with the exception of just a few nations. Uh, it's more frequent than cystic fibrosis, di uh, type 1 diabetes, neonatal hypothyroidism, and it's also as lethal as AIDS, if not treated. There, there's something called the founder effect. Um, and the founder effect can increase prevalence up to 1 in 67 for South African Ashkenazi Jews. And the importance there is you, you need to know your audience. And here in South, uh, Southeast Florida, the audience is quite interesting. So we have Christian Lebanese, South African Afrikaners, we have, have South African Ashkenazi Jews, 
Ashkenazi Jews, French Canadians, these are all founder populations with a much higher prevalence of FH. So this is really a hotbed for FH down in southeast Florida. And we have a lot of FH patients, a lot. So much more than many other parts of the United States, and we have to be aware of that. This is an autosomal dominant disorder. There, there are certain very, very rare circumstances where it's autosomal recessive, but the importance of autosomal dominant means if, a, if one, of the, uh, a, a one parent has, uh, is a heterozygote, there's a 50% chance uh, that each of those chi uh, children will have the disorder, 50%. That's, you know, pretty significant. Um, at least four different genes can be involved in this, and fairly frequently we'll see that somebody comes up with a, a, a new discovery of a mutation in a new gene that can affect the LDL receptor functionality. Um, so this is constantly changing, but we should know that the LDL receptor, ApoB, PCSK9 are the most common forms. Uh, LDL receptor far and away uh, is the most common uh, site of a mutation. Again, back to the genetic evolution. There are over 1,700. Remember, initially it was that single mutation, single mutation in the 70s that it was thought. There are over 1,700 mutations that have now been identified. Now, not all of these are pathogenic, but many of them are. Uh, and there are varying degrees of receptor activity, from null, meaning no receptor activity, to some receptor activity with these pathogenic mutations. And then the nomenclature has become quite confusing. So when you read a lot of papers, and more and more papers will come out. Again, remember, with the PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of papers on uh, FH more and more because it is one of the indications. So uh, you'll see the terms simple um, homozygous, this is for homozygous FH, you'll see the terms simple homozygous FH, compound, and double. Uh, heterozygous FH. So the simple homozygous FH is what's called single and same mutation. So the, each uh, child will receive one allele for a gene from one parent and one allele from the other parent. And the single and same means it's the single um, uh, gene and the same mutation. So LDL receptor being the most common one. There'll be one mutation, one gene, that's actually not a very common phenomenon, right? That's what early on it was thought would be the most common one. It's really not very common. The most common phenomenon is this compound heterozygote. Now, this is where it's confusing because we're saying a compound heterozygote, it's a homozygote. So we're using the word heterozygote in a homozygote. But it is a homozygote. So a compound heterozygote is somebody who's got, let's, let's say we're talking about the LDL receptor. It's got uh, two alleles, one from mother, one from father. Both have mutations, but the mo mutations are different. So it's a single gene, LDL receptor, but not the same mutation, different mutations. That's a compound heterozygote. Then you have the double heterozygote, and that's where it really gets confusing. And typically that's the LDL receptor, so that's, th that's one gene. And then you have a different gene, like let's say PCSK9 that has mutation, or ApoB that has a mutation. So two different genes, and obviously two different mutations. This brings in a whole host of problems, because with one of Mendel's laws of uh, independent assortment, you have the problem of how do you pass these things on to your kids? Well, it's conceivable that a double heterozygote, for example, can pass on both of these mutations to a single child. So you can have a homozygote creating a homozygote child with a normal spouse. So it used to be felt that you needed both parents to be heterozygotes to create the, or one homozygote and the other heterozygote to create a homozygote child. In reality, you can have one normal parent and a double heterozygote parent and create a double heterozygote child, which is a homozygote. I know that's confusing, but I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so how did we come to this conclusion about the increased prevalence of, uh, of FH? 
Well, there are three um, very significant studies that were done in the last three years, and they were done in different parts of the world. The first was in Copenhagen, and it was with 69,000 patients, and they used the Dutch Lipid Clinic Network to assess patients on clinical grounds and found that about 1 in 137 people were heterozygous FH patients. Again, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium then came up with 100, 1 in 130,000 were homozygous. This was then altered later in a, in a follow-up paper to bring it closer to 1 in 200. Subsequent paper, uh, these were genotyped. This was in the Netherlands. 100,000 patients were genotyped. And I want to bring your attention to a couple of, of points here. These were looking at the homozygotes in this particular paper. Okay, these are uh, the autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia mutations, double autosomal dominant, so it's homozygotes. But the thing I want to point out here is look at the excluded patients. They excluded double heterozygotes, and there were 25, and there were about 25 compound heterozygotes also. They were included but they excluded the double heterozygotes that accounted for about the same number of compound heterozygotes. And what this did was completely alter their prevalence, making it look much less prevalent than it really is. And they did this because they couldn't include them in the Hardy-Weinberg equation, even though there is actually a more complex Hardy-Weinberg equation that could have actually included this. Um, they also included consanguinity. Um, they excluded consanguinity, which probably should not have been done. But the numbers they arrived at, even with the exclusion of double heterozygosity and, and consanguinity, the numbers they arrived at were still showing much greater prevalence at 1 in 244 for heterozygote and 1 in 420,000 for the homozygotes. So that still is much more common than the 1 in 500 and 1 in a million that we all grew up thinking we were going to see. The final study came from America, from Harvard, from Dr. Cathurston, who showed that the prevalence of the heterozygote in the individual that he looked at, which was an individual with an LDL greater than 190, so making it more difficult, actually, to, uh, to have both an LDL greater than 190 and an LDL receptor mutation that's pathogenic, the, the prevalence was 1 in 217. So if you actually allowed patients to have lower LDL numbers, that prevalence would have been even lower. And there is some other data may come out showing that that prevalence is, in fact, lower. Let's look at the pathophysiology. LDL receptor metabolism. So I'm just going to bring up this whole thing and then hold on, talk to you about it. All right, so basically what happens here, so you have your LDL particles floating around in the blood, you have your LDL receptors in these clathrin-coated pits, the LDL receptors bind the ligand, which is on ApoB, they bring the LDL particles into an endosome, the LDL receptor then separates off, goes up to be recycled, re reused, the LDL particle is then broken down in a lysosome. All its parts are broken apart, the lipids, the amino acids, everything is utilized, and then the LDL receptor can do its thing again. What happens if the LDL receptor is non-functional or is poorly functional? You have a lot of LDL particles floating around, a lot of LDL cholesterol, and you get disease. And that's what you have here high LDL cholesterol levels, you get disease. This is adapted from uh, a, a very well-known slide by Horton. It was published in the Journal of Clinical Lipidology. And the two take-home points from this slide are the origin of this is at minus nine months. In other words, at, uh, prenatally. So as the fetus with FH is developing, that fetus is bathing in extraordinarily high LDL cholesterol. So the process is starting before birth. And that's a very important thing to recognize because it's lifetime elevated LDL that causes the problem in FH. These people don't 
wake up at age 30 or 40 and develop an LDL of 150, 200, 300, et cetera, they have this from before birth. The other thing that's important to recognize is the, the, uh, the point where these uh, lines intersect with the cardiovascular event. And the fact that if you alter other cardiovascular risk factors, you can actually shift these lines and you can delay the onset of cardiovascular events. So uh, just like uh, others have spoken, such as Dr. Fazio, we have to always go after therapeutic lifestyle changes. Therapeutic lifestyle changes are the foundation of every aspect of preventive cardiology. Um, and they are in FH as well. And here you see it again, everything. We go after every cardiovascular risk in an FH patient as well. We don't just raise our hands and go, FH, genetic, sorry. Uh, we go after everything. Now, the older perspective also looked at LDL cholesterol levels and said, okay, um, to, to have homozygous FH uh, on lipid-lowering therapy, one would have to have an LDL cholesterol that was greater than 300. And off lipid-lowering therapy, one would have to have an LDL cholesterol greater than 500. That was the old teaching, and just keep those numbers in mind. Greater than 300 on lipid-lowering therapy, greater than 500 off lipid-lowering therapy. I'll show you something, a few slides, that uh, will change your thought process about that. It was also thought that everybody with HOFH would die at a very young age. That, too, is not true. So I have, just like others uh, here, have patients in their practice with homozygous FH. In the 30s, 40s, 50s, I have an 82-year-old with homozygous FH. So that is not true. It's important to know that the coronaries are not the only vascular bed involved with HOFH or HEFH. In fact, there was a recent paper, uh, which I uh, didn't, did not have time, actually, to, to include here, um, but it showed that peripheral arterial disease is increased in patients with FH. Um, and uh, that was uh, published by Santos. Um, valvular heart disease increases. So this is in homozygous FH, aortic stenosis, and supravalvular aortic stenosis. So if you have somebody with FH or homozygous FH, always think about AS and supravalvular AS. There's a 20-fold increase in the risk of cardiovascular disease in those with heterozygous FH, and if untreated, men have a 50% risk of, of clinical cardiovascular disease by the age of 50, women a 30% risk of clinical cardiovascular disease by age 60. About 20% of all uh, events um, infarcts uh, in pe people under the age of 45 occur in FH patients. So when you go to the cath lab and you have a, a, somebody who, who presents with an infarct, you got to think FH. You know, that person goes to the lab, has an infarct, goes home, I will bet you 99% of the time FH is not discussed with the patient. And yet, one-fifth of those patients has FH. And we need to be able to say, you might have FH because not only are you going to identify that individual and treat that individual differently, but you're going to be able to then cascade screen the family and perhaps save the children and save the, pa the patient's parents, perhaps. Here are some physical stigmata of FH. Xanthelasma is not pathognomonic for FH, but it's a clue. Corneal arcus under the age of 45 is pathognomonic. Tendon xanthomas, pathognomonic. A planar xanthoma that you see in the bottom corner, that flat one, some believe pathognomonic for homozygous FH. I always take out my iPhone. My vision's not wonderful. I take out my iPhone. I take a picture of everybody's eye, and then I expand it, and it enables me to see the corneas. I have some beautiful images of corneal arcus. I know it may sound a little weird, but uh, I have a collection that I keep at home. So. Uh, <laughs> This is from that, uh, that famed Netherlands 100,000 genotype study. Now, if you look at this, what I there are a few things I love about this slide, but one of them is if you look uh, on the left, you'll see that the open diamond represents an individual 
who had one no mutation and one defective mutation, and that's the highest untreated patient. So it's not the null no that's the highest in this particular series, it's the null negative. So you even get variability across mutations. So it's not always the null null that's going to be your worst patient. Sometimes it could be a null negative, a, a null a defective, excuse me. Sometimes it might be a defective defective. So it's very interesting. The other thing is that if you look uh, under the, the horizontal lines, just multiply by approximately 40, it's a little under 40, by approximately 40 and you'll get milligrams per deciliter, about half the people would not qualify on the basis of LDL for the prior criteria for homozygous FH. Yet genetically, every one of these is a confirmed HOFH patient. So we know that utilizing the old LDL criteria for HOFH is not a good thing. Doesn't work. Just not enough. We can go down the clinical and genetic uh, roads to make the diagnosis of FH. In the United States, we are not doing that outside the academic world. We're using clinical criteria to make the diagnosis of FH. Clinical criteria I'll discuss in a few moments. Um, Simon Broom Register, Dutch Lipid Clinic Network, both utilize a constellation of physical findings. Um, I showed you what some of them are. Family history, LDL levels, come up with a scoring system and give you a sense of whether or not the patient has FH. You can get those systems on your smartphones, actually. MedPed, developed in uh, University of Utah, uses LDL, so it's LDL-centric. It's a little problematic. It relies very heavily on understanding your family history. That sometimes can be difficult. Um, and it's a, you have to have the chart. Most people don't use MedPed at this point. That might change, but at this point, that's the case. I've already told you that genetic testing is problematic in the States. It's very costly. It's limited. Perhaps with next generation sequencing, when the cost comes down, things will change. Right now, it's not incredibly accurate as well. We miss a lot of cases. This is a patient with HOFH at a young age, had a bypass, has xanthomas, LDL cholesterol of 800. Very, very sick, you know, on far end of the spectrum of HOFH. Here's a patient I met when I was giving a talk on FH. And this happens actually fairly frequently. I give a talk on FH. Somebody in the audience comes up afterwards. Uh, you know, I think uh, I might have that disorder. Uh, and this is a, a medical personnel, right? I think I might have that disorder. So we spoke a little bit. I asked if I could feel her, her uh, Achilles. By the way, whenever you examine the, uh, <laughs> I know. Um, whenever you examine the pedal pulses, always reach around and feel the Achilles tendon. Because once you do that, you'll feel if, if somebody has a thickened Achilles, uh, and you'll, you'll become accustomed to understanding when they have a xanthoma. Because sometimes it's just a thickening of the Achilles. You don't feel discrete xanthomas. She had Achilles xanthomas. And she said, yeah, you know, something, I've had that for a long time. I never understood why my, my tendons are so thick. So she has a history of high cholesterol for a long time. At age 32, she had a total cholesterol of almost 400, LDL over 300, HDL 45, triglycerides 124. By the way, the typical uh, FH patient has a triglyceride that's a little bit on the high side of normal and an HDL that's a little on the low side of normal. Um, her LP little a was eight. Other people will talk about LP little a, but many people with FH have elevated LP little a. 20% of the population has an LP little a that's elevated. Perhaps up to 50% of, of FH patients will have this. She did not, thankfully, because it significantly elevates risk. This is her cornea. I, I really like her cornea larcus. I think it's a really cool one, actually. Um, so it's, it's subtle, but uh, with the blue eye, you know. I'm partially colorblind, so maybe it doesn't impress you, but uh, for me, it, it does something for me. All right, <laughs> anyway, this, this, is, this is not a great image, but she, it, it, this is actually, believe it or not, her Achilles, but you know, you have to understand, I'm like trying to grab the picture at a lecture and whatever. So 
All right, and th then I, I, I was able to get her into the office, uh, and this is her carotid, and you see the far wall, not a great image, but she does have a small, uh, small plaque that is starting in the carotid. Um, she has definite FH, okay, LDL, you know, over 300. Um, she needed aggressive therapy. She is non-compliant. Um, she, she was lost to follow-up. Uh, she never screened her children. She was adopted, by the way, so I couldn't get a, a family history from her. Um, but she's lost a follow-up. Uh, I am sure she's not taking medicine, and, I, and unfortunately, outlook is, is not good. Um, in terms of the National Lipid Association recommendations, uh, universal screening is recommended uh, for patients uh, at the age of two. Now, the, the reason it's two and not birth, by the way, um, you know, at birth, LDL falls, uh, prior to birth, I should say, LDL falls dramatically. So although in utero, uh, FH patients have a very high LDL, everybody's LDL falls immediately prior to birth. It, that's um, one of the hypotheses is it's related to in, in the innate immunity of ApoB that in association with Staph aureus. Um, and because of that relationship, we drop our LDLs, and then it rises back up at, to age two, and then levels off. So we're supposed to test them at age two. Um, all kids should be screened between nine and 11, okay? Does this happen all the time? No. In terms of cascade screening, we can use the genetic approach or the clinical approach, clinical being LDL testing. Uh, very, very difficult to do. I try to do it. Uh, the FH Foundation has an initiative. We'll start this uh, very, very soon, actually, where we'll, we will establish a, the, actually the first active cascade screening program uh, in the U.S., and we encourage people, everybody, to get involved in this. Um, but we'll make it easier we'll, with genetic counselors. We'll make it easier for everybody to do this. It's very hard when you tell your patient you know, this is passive cascade screening. You tell your patient, please contact your relatives. You have FH. They could have FH, blah, blah, blah. It just doesn't happen. And in the, the Netherlands, who do this better than anybody else, for every proband pro band or every index case identified with FH, eight additional FH patients were identified, eight. So one initial patient eight additional ones. That's why it's so important to do cascade screening. So uh, in diagnosing FH, it's vital, it's fa fairly straightforward, leads to better management, um, results in recognition and treatment of affected members. About one to two million Americans, given these new prevalence statistics, will have FH, and uh, fewer than 10 percent or 1 percent, depending upon what you read or believe, uh, are currently diagnosed. All right, uh, diagnosing HOFH, helpful clues. Both parents, remember the double heterozygosity uh, uh, issue though, both parents having high cholesterol and, and or early vascular disease, that's a clue. Very high LDL, it, based upon your definition of that, that's, uh, that's a clue. Premature vascular disease in the patient. Limited response to lipid-lowering therapy. What that means is you put a patient on a statin, for instance, and they just don't respond as well as you would think. They drop 25% or 20% instead of the 50 or 60% that you would anticipate, and that's because statins and the other common drugs that we utilize are dependent upon LDL receptor function. If LDL receptor function is diminished, the drugs don't work as well and physical stigmata. Um, so this is continually underdiagnosed and concomitant under treatment occurs, therefore. Uh, we have our problems. Non-paternity is a problem, I should mention that. In certain socioeconomic uh, circumstances, non-paternity can go up to as high as 30 percent, 30 percent. Very awkward conversation. I've had that conversation. It's horrible. You don't want to have that conversation if you can avoid it. Um, all right, so in terms of current treatments, rapidly go through this. Uh, therapeutic lifestyle changes, please, I just, I, I can't overstate this. It's, it's critical in everything we do, therapeutic lifestyle changes. Goals of therapy, you know, there's that 50% uh, rule, greater than 50%. I would say in these patients, as low as you can get them, okay? In the Netherlands, interestingly, in the heterozygous population, when they are treated, 
insurances do not rate them. In other words, they consider them as normal patients. So that's very encouraging. This shows us on the left the heterozygous patients and on the right the homozygotes with statin therapy. These are, these are survival curves and shows that you can impact them. You can impact their survival with the administration of statins. This is uh, my apheresis uh, unit and it's a comfortable procedure. This is not a horrific procedure. This is not like hemodialysis, and I apologize to any nephrologists in the room, but th this is not, you know, they don't walk out of there stumbling and exhausted. They actually walk out of there feeling energized. They actually feel better when they leave. This is what a filter looks like afterwards. It starts as white. Okay, and this is what happens to the LDL. The LDL drops down precipitously and then rises. It does not rise in a linear fashion. It rises quickly and then it kind of slopes off. And then you do it every one or two weeks. Here are drug therapies that were uh, approved a couple of years ago for homozygous FH, only for homozygous FH. The first is lomidopide, the second is mipomersin. Lomidopide is an MTP inhibitor. Mipomersin is an antisense oligonucleotide. Lomidopide is oral. Mipomersin is injection. Um, I'll show you very quickly how they work. Lomidopide, again, MTP inhibitor, does two things, stabilizes ApoB as uh, it's being translated. Uh, it also, on a one-to-one -one basis, will bring a triglyceride from the uh, membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum to the growing VLDL particle or the gro and the growing ApoB100 in the, obviously, in the, um, in the enterocyte. It is growing an ApoB48 and a chylomicron, all right? So that's what that does. If you block that, you block the production of VLDL in the hepatocyte, you block the production of the chylomicron in the enterocyte. Here's MIPO. MIPO is an antisense oligonucleotide, so it's a little tiny strand, uh, complementary strand of messenger RNA for ApoB100. It binds the ApoB100 uh, mRNA. It then gets targeted for degradation. It's destroyed. Uh, by an enzyme, we make less ApoB100. I'm getting the signal. This is a liver transplantation. Uh, that is still used sometimes. Um, and in terms of management, I remember from my NYU days uh, the, the motto, time is muscle. These are this, the first Timmy trial. Uh, we used to wear a baseball cap and we used to have uh, pins that said time is muscle. I think today we need to say time is plaque in the FH patients because time really is plaque. This is a disease that requires our urgent attention. Uh, we can now, uh, I think, pay attention and actually do something about it. This is an algorithm. You have it there. I won't, uh, I won't take time uh, explaining it to you with the exception of this. Uh, all it does is try to focus attention on risk and risk being, first, making the diagnosis of FH, second, trying to differentiate the very, very high-risk FH patient from just the typically high-risk FH patient, and you do that on the basis of burden of vascular disease, and that's what that does. And then the FH Foundation, and we have Rihanna, who's going to talk about the FH Foundation and her experience in life. Please get involved in the FH Foundation. Send your patients to the, uh, the Cascade FH Registry. Um, and in conclusion, hey, this is a common and potentially lethal genetic disorder. Um, it's underdiagnosed and undertreated, unfortunately. Can be diagnosed on clinical grounds. And I've given you the tools I hope to do that. Cascade screening is essential. Remember, eight patients for every proband or index case. Uh, treatment uh, options abound, including lipoprotein apheresis, which is not a painful and horrific procedure. Uh, eliminating other cardiovascular risks does help. You got to you got to clip away at every other risk factor. Spread the word. En enroll your patients in Cascade FH uh, registry through the FH Foundation. If you want, I am very happy to enroll your patients. We're one of the sites for that. Um, if you're from other parts of the country, look up where the sites are and enroll your patients. Thank you very much. Now, re <laughs> you want to introduce Rihanna? Oh, okay. Thank you. Questions after this week.
Okay, we'll, have, we'll still have time for reviewing our, uh, our questions at the end of the session and, and a little bit of a panel time, but uh, Rhiannon uh, Eads is uh, a patient with heterozygous FH. Uh, she's here on behalf of the FH Foundation. Uh, and as, as I said, I, I know her well. She is fantastic. Uh, she's going to talk to you about a patient perspective, living well with FH, and uh, she's from Athens, Georgia. She's a bulldog. Good morning. Um, this is my first time doing this, and there are a lot of you in the room. <laughs> So um, I am Rhiannon Needs, and I have heterozygous familiar hypercholesterolemia. Um, I'm here on behalf of the FH Foundation as an advocate for awareness, and I would like to thank Dr. Baum for inviting me to speak with you today. Uh, let's see. Okay, so the FH Foundation is a patient-centered nonprofit organization dedicated to education, advocacy, and research of FH. Our mission is to raise awareness of FH and save lives by increasing the rate and early diagnosis and uh, encouraging proactive treatment. So uh, the FH Foundation kind of has four talking points. Number one, FH is different. Number two, FH is life-threatening. Number three, FH is underdiagnosed. And four, FH is manageable. I hope that by uh, sharing my story, you'll, you'll see that in action. And this is my family my husband, my two adorable children. Okay, so I was diagnosed with FH almost by chance about eight years ago. I had a life insurance physical and just out of curiosity, I asked to see my cholesterol numbers. You can imagine I was floored when uh, my LDL was 318. I am not um, Dr. Baum's patient that he was talking about earlier. So. I knew enough about cholesterol to know that this was a problem, and I'm embarrassed to say that I had never had my cholesterol checked, at least not that I knew about, because young, active, take good care of myself, never thought I had to worry about it. So I went to a cardiologist, and uh, he suggested I go see Dr. Sperling at Emory, and Dr. Sperling has been my lipidologist for a long time now. So before my diagnosis, I had never heard of FH, but the more I learned about it, the more I realized that FH has known my family for as far back as anyone can remember. Um, my dad had his first heart attack when he was 36, and I, I remember it clearly. It was terrifying. Um, our family didn't have health insurance, and being a stereotypical man, uh, my dad just didn't go to the doctor very regularly, even after having his heart attack. Um, unfortunately, he died from a massive heart attack when he was only 51. And um, you can just imagine how shocked and devastated we all were. It's been over 10 years since he's been gone, and I can't even express how much I miss him. I mean, he was hardworking, he was caring, he was talented, and he was hilarious. He would have been an amazing grandpa for my two children, whom he never got to meet. Before my diagnosis, we always thought that dad was a victim of his lifestyle. I mean, he was, young, he was thin and active too, but he smoked, ate some things he probably shouldn't have, and did not see a doctor regularly. However, when I told my family members that I had, about my cholesterol, I learned that many relatives were also on statins. My grandma was a big genealogy buff, and um, in her research, she found that there were lots of cases of early heart disease in our family on her side. Um, lots of stories about people having heart attacks, dropping dead from a heart attack before the age of 50. And even with all this family history, nobody had ever even heard of FH in my family. So since being diagnosed, Dr. Sperling has really helped me manage my FH. Um, it took a few tries before we found a statin that, that uh, worked well for me, and I've been on the highest dose for a while now. I also take a bile acid sequestrant, and I work out all the time. <laughs> I do jazzercise about four or five days a week, and because I'm so active, my HDL, the last time it was tested, is about 70, which I'm very proud of. Um, Diet-wise, I try my best to stick to a Mediterranean diet, which isn't always easy when you're cooking for a family with a couple of picky children. Um, I try to do a lot of vegetables and fruits, a lot of lean protein, low-fat dairy, uh, 
healthy fats, like a little bit of avocado, a um, handful of almonds here and there. And, um, and I always get a big kick out of telling people that, yes, my doctor tells me I have to eat a square of dark chocolate every day. So that's pretty awesome. <laughs> So I guess you could say that I'm an FH success story. I found out about it before I had any kind of heart event. So I consider myself to be very fortunate. And as hard as I work at it, though, my LDL isn't, right, isn't quite where it needs to be. I'd like it to be lower. It's about 120 or so. And, um, and honestly, I worry about it every day. Every twinge, I think to myself, oh my gosh, is this my heart attack? Is this the day? Um, I've been to the emergency room for having a panic attack. Um, I've had lots of tests to make sure I'm okay. And um, I'm so worried about it, even though I'm doing everything I can to manage it, because I want to be here for my family. Um, I don't want to miss their milestones. I don't want them to miss me. My daughter, she's, been, uh, she's had her screening done, and she seems to be doing okay. My four-year-old son has not been tested yet, but he will be soon. Um, Dr. Sperling told me about the FH Foundation a few years ago and encouraged me to get involved as an advocate. And I'm so glad I did. It's a wonderful organization. They have done so much for me. I've learned a lot about the disorder and I've made great connections with other patients. You know, it's always encouraging to know you're not alone. Um, so I'm really happy to have the opportunity to be here today to raise awareness about this disorder. And I really hope that my experience can help other families avoid what my family has gone through. Um, if you haven't, please take a look at our website, thefhfoundation.org. You can learn a lot more about the organization. There's great patient education. There's um, the information about the Cascade Registry. Um, and, and like Dr. Baum said, most of the people who have FH are undiagnosed, and we really need your help to find those patients. So there are lots of things you can do to help. Um, and if you'd like to stop by in the exhibitor hall, I'm there during the break so we can talk about it. Um, encourage your patients to join our registry. Share our patient education materials with your patients. Um, you can always invite an advocate like myself to come speak to a group. And um, once again, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here with you today.